Hi, today's little quickie is for Robert, uh, who lives just outside Quebec City. Now, it's not a little quickie because he asked me a question. It's a little quickie because this little quickie might just end up being a little quickie. I'm going to try and keep it nice and short. And Robert was razzing me a bit the other day about the fact that my little quickies are getting a little long. So, today's little quickie is all about keys and key seats. More specifically, we're going to be talking about square and rectangular keys and key seats. Uh, well, actually more about square because rectangular keys are generally reserved for very large shafts. So we're talking about six, six and a half inches and larger. And since I do this for novice home machinists, while well, we can pretty well figure out that we won't be working on very many six and a half inch shafts. And the numbers we're going to be using, what well, we're going to get from our machinery's handbook. And we're going to get those numbers in our section inch uh, keys and key seats. So we're going to be doing this in Imperial. And we're going to be using the tables one through four in the handbook. So let's get over to the whiteboard and take a look at what our numbers are and what they mean. So let's take a look here. I think we have everything we need. And it all starts with the shaft. And in this case, I've chosen to work with a half inch shaft. And using the table one in my handbook, I find that for a half inch shaft, the standard or the normal key to use would be a 1 8 inch square key. Now, since a half inch shaft is quite small, uh, a rectangular key is really not called for here. As I said before, six and a half inches and larger is what's recommended for rectangular key use. So a square one inch, one eighth of an inch key is what we want here. And how we're we going to measure that? Well, I know that I'm going to have a groove in my shaft and a groove in my hub. But how deep and how wide to perform, produce these grooves? Well, my groove in my shaft is going to be given to me in my table 2 as my S dimension. And that's a distance from the bottom of the shaft to the bottom of the key seat. And for my hub, the distance that's given to me in my table 2 is T. And that's 560 thousandths of an inch. And that T is the distance from the bottom of the hole in my hub to the top of the key seat in the hub. Now the question is why? Why am I doing it this way? Well, there's the problem of the height of the cord. Now, the cordal height here is the distance between a straight line from one corner to the other of my half key way to the top of where the shaft would be if it were still there, if I hadn't cut that groove. And that C distance causes a lot of problems. And oftentimes, when home machinists are cutting keyway slots, well, they don't take into account the cordal height. Maybe because they don't know that it's a problem, or maybe it's just too complicated to calculate. But my handbook in the table too takes away from me the obligation to calculate that height because it gives me a distance. And for my half inch shaft here, the distance my handbook indicates is that my S distance should be 430 thousandths of an inch. That is the proper depth if I take out the cordal thickness. Now if I want to calculate from the top of where that part was before I cut it, well obviously I'll have my depth of key seat plus that. It gets a little complicated to calculate. Not that complicated, but why do it? If my table 2 gives it to me, might as well use that. And it's easy to measure because it's easy to measure from the bottom here to the bottom of my shaft. Now, you may say, what if the groove doesn't go right to the end of the shaft? I might have a difficult time getting something in there. Not really. Use a pin that's the nominal diameter of the groove that you're cutting. In this case, a 1 8 groove. So I put a 1 8 pin in my groove. And I measure from the top of my pin to the bottom of the part. And that is 
uh, deadly easy to do and it will give me an accurate dimension and in this case it would be s plus the diameter of my pin quite simple to do now on my hub i wouldn't have that problem because the hub is always going to come out to one end and in that case well i'll just measure with the inside part of a vernier caliper or with a stick mic or with an inside micrometer uh, the distance between there and there to get my 560 thousandths of an inch. So I can see that with table 1 and table 2 I'm doing pretty good. Now table 3 isn't here because it has to do with the uh, nominal dimensions or the standard dimensions of key stock that you can use. Now obviously if you buy key stock you want to verify if it's the proper dimension. Well you can look in table 3 to find out those dimensions and table 4 is going to indicate to us how much play we can have on the width and on the height between the keys and the grooves for this to be a functional uh, assembly. Now, one last thing I need to mention is that we have class 1 or class 2 fits with keys. It's basically the same thing. The class 2 is a little tighter uh, just because it's a little more accurate so there's less tolerance on it. But what we generally use for most applications is the class 1 fits and that's the numbers that I have right here. So let's go take a look at what's in the handbook, take a look at these charts and try and make sense of all this. So in table 1 we have key size versus shaft diameter. So we're looking for a half inch shafts so that's over 7 sixteenths and up to 9 sixteenths. That tells us that we need a 1 8 inch wide key and obviously if we're using a square key it's going to be one eighth of an inch high. Then we can see our table 2 that gives us our S and T dimensions or our S and T depth control values. So we're looking at one half inch diameter shaft for a square key on the shaft I have a S value of 0.430 or 430 thousandths of an inch and for my hub value my T value for a square a key seat, I have a T value of 560 thousandths of an inch. Table 3 gives us our standardized or normalized key dimensions. And finally our table 4 gives us our clearances, or if you prefer the interaction between the keys and the key seats. In the width we can see that we have from 0 to 4 thousandths of an inch of clearance, and in the height we have anywhere from 5 to 32 thousandths of an inch clearance for a 1 8 key in a half inch shaft. It's important to note before you have a mathematical conniption that the end result of clearance for top and bottom fits, the 5 thou to 32 thousandths of an inch, are the result of adding or subtracting the clearances for the key, key seat shaft, key seat hub from the S and T dimensions that we obtained in table 2. Now there's a lot of videos out there about how to cut keyways on a mill or on a lathe or whatnot. But one thing we don't get to see too often, well it's just straightforward, good old fashioned harbor press uh, broaching. So let's take a look at how to broach that 1 8 groove in a half inch hole. So here we have our broach set and let's take a look at what we have. On the cover here I've positioned two brooches a one-eighth of an inch brooch and a quarter inch brooch and their second cut shims because these brooches are going to cut into passes. Uh, also we can see in the cover that I've positioned a gear blank that hasn't been broached yet. This is the gears that I used to get my students to cut so we've uh, we've made many many hundreds of those over the years and right behind it well we have our guide bushing that's going to be inserted into the hole of the gear blank and that's going to guide uh, the brooch uh, through, through the hole so that it cuts uh, nice and straight. If we look over to the left here well we have a bolster block that I made up to hold the gear blank up off the base of the punch or, or of the press I should say and uh, give me some room to work. Now I made this because as I said we used to make several uh, of these gear blanks every year so it was worth my while to make a little tool for that. And if we pan out here well we can see that all this comes in a set that covers 
most of the basic sizes that you'd want to do. So if you're going to be doing some grooving at home for keyways and key slots, well, a brooch set like this would probably be a pretty good thing to have. So we can install the bolster block, install the guide bushing in the blank, install the blank on the bolster part, insert the brooch into the blank and start pushing through uh, with the arbor press. Watch out for your fingers. This brooch cuts slowly but it'll really chunk a good part of your thumb pad off if you're not careful how you hold the part as you push the brooch through it. Now pull the brooch right through the part, bring the arbor press back to its top position, clean everything off, now we're going to insert our second pass shim into the guide uh, bushing and reinsert our brooch into the part. Don't forget to apply a few drops of high pressure cutting oil to help everything out. Now once our brooch is back into the part, and sometimes you have to fiddle with it a little bit to get it in there, well, we simply pass a second time. Now here's the danger. Watch your thumb because you don't want to cut a piece of it off. Now push through a second time. Watch out how you hold things. And once you're through this second time, well the brooch groove is complete. Once again, well, we'll pull our brooch right through the part and take everything apart. You can see here that we have really nice chips, so a really good cutting action. It's nice to see. Now, this shim is easy to lose, so make sure you keep an eye on where you put it because you're going to want to keep everything together. And there we go. A nice groove produced in our part right through both sides. It's really just that simple. Well, there you go. Square keys. Now, it's important to get those dimensions right. Because if you get too much play between a shaft and a hub, because the key is just way too loose in those uh, slots and grooves, well, you're going to get wear. And every time you load or unload, or if you prefer every time you turn on or turn off the rotation of that shaft, you're going to get a hit on the key. And over time, that's going to get looser and looser, and it's going to end up damaging everything. On the other side, you don't want your keys too tight. If we have a keyed installation, it's because it's something that has to be driven positively, but that must be able to be easily disassembled. That's what keys are for. Hi, I'm back. I filmed this a few days ago and as I'm putting everything together I realized that I should have been a little more clear about this chordal thickness height thing and why it's important to have our S dimension rather than what we would normally do and that is measure from the top down. And that's the problem. When we're cutting a groove on a shaft in the milling machine what most people will do is find the zero on the top of the shaft come off the shaft, come down and cut. And that works, but it, it sort of eliminates any possibility for remeasurement because the part that we touched off isn't there anymore. Now, it can still be done. It's just a little more complex and maybe a little touchier. Uh, if we measure from the bottom up, well, obviously, that is no longer a problem. Now, what's important to note is that we want the key to engage halfway into the shaft and halfway into the hub. And that is a problem when we touch off because we touch here and this chordal thickness has to be added to the lower half of the groove. So if we were cutting from the top, we'd have to calculate the chordal thickness plus half our key. But that's not all. The play that we have height-wise in the assembly of the key in the slots well, should mostly be in the shaft. And that's simply due to the fact that we need a lot of engagement down here and centrifugal force tends to push the key up into the hub. Well, the hub is stronger as far as contact goes than the shaft. The shaft, well, it has a shear that comes out of the shaft when it forces, 
whereas the shear on the hub comes into the hub a lot stronger. The only reason why we often have hub failures is due to the fact that the hubs are often in softer or more delicate or weaker materials. But in reality, it's the shaft that needs the most engagement as much as possible. So if I want it half in, I don't want clearance on the hub groove, I want clearance on the shaft groove. And uh, that clearance is important because I have to add it to the coral thickness. So to avoid all that, we do it this way. And the S dimension that you get in your chart will already include the chordal thickness and the clearance on the shaft. So it's all figured out for us in advance, and that's really a good thing. And one more thing that needs to be said. Uh, when you're assembling your keys and your shaft and your hubs, uh, make sure that your keys, the corners, are knocked off. You don't want any burrs, and even a small radius on those corners would be great. Oftentimes we have trouble when assembling uh, keys and key slots, uh, not because my things aren't at the right dimension, but just because there's burrs on the keys, and you can save yourself a lot of headaches by just knocking those burrs off right off the bat. Now, if you've survived up to now, well, you've learned what you need to learn about the charts to be able to find your dimensions. But uh, square and rectangular keys aren't the only keys. There's taper keys, there's tapered head keys, and there's obviously woodruff keys. Now, all those are similar uh, as far as the way the charts function. So if you can get around your square one, you'll probably be able to be functional with the others. However, the woodruff keys are those famous half-moon positional keys. Their advantage is that once positioned along a shaft, well, they stay in place because the groove that they're in obviously has that half-moon or concave shape to it. They're produced quite differently and you need specialized tools to do that. So for the home shop, usually the best way to go is the good old square key. Well, Robert, I hope that little quickie was quick enough for you. It's great to know that you're watching. And to everyone, happy machining. Obviously not.